cool. We're officially recording um, our 51st ever knowledge drop with Anne here, special <laughs> guest for the day. I'm super excited about this topic. Um, it's something that definitely speaks to me and something I'm hoping to do with the, my future. Um, so yeah, let me just explain some of the housekeeping stuff before we jump into it. And uh, then we'll start. I'll pass it over to Anne. So basically, you guys, I think I'll see the chat box. You can go ahead and write to each other there as long as it's set to all panelists and attendees. You can use the chat box. There's also a Q&A box. So as we're going through the slide deck, feel free to put any questions you might have in the Q&A box there. And then as I mentioned, this is getting recorded. So this will live on in our Knowledge Drop YouTube archive for all of eternity as long as the internet exists. And you guys can pass this to any of your friends that might be thinking about opening a co-living place or a hostel someday. Um, and yeah, hopefully this is a subject that you're interested in too. Tanner and I were chatting as he jumped down here early. Um, he's thinking about opening in a place in Mexico City someday. I've definitely thought about opening a place as well someday, and I'm guessing that's partially why some of you guys have joined the call as well. So thanks for being here. Thanks again for doing this, Anne, and I'll pass the mic over to you. Thank you, Travis. All right, let me share my screen with you guys and start the presentation. Share. All right, here we go. You can see me, hear me. All right, so yeah, thanks for uh, joining me on this knowledge drop about why I started a co-living space and why I think that you should get involved in the movement too. Um, my name is Anna and I'm from Magellan, or I did Magellan. And um, I want to talk to you a little bit about what a co-living is, some statistics about the movements, some things that are happening right now, and then a little bit more about my story and my beliefs and findings about uh, why I started, what I think makes a good co-living, um, self-driven communities, which is something new, but I think really interesting that's like getting more and more popular right now as well and my three biggest tips for opening a co-living just at the end. Uh, why am I dropping this? Well, I started a co-living, nine co-living in Tenerife uh, about a year ago. I moved here a year ago in June, uh, opened up in September. So I've been running the space ever since, and I'm pretty involved in the co-living movement and all the entrepreneurs that are now starting um, with these companies. So first of all, co-living, is it new? No, of course not. We've all been living in groups together for many years in student housing, in hostels, summer camps. Here on the island, there's a bunch of hippies that live in caves and tents together. So no, it's not new. But some things are happening, so some things are new. And one of those is that uh, a lot of people are now choosing this lifestyle instead of where before, a lot of the times it was more like a necessity. Um, so one of them is that right now co-living is becoming a choice and because of that and because it's getting more interesting um, there's an industry developing and that's why getting involved in this movement starting a co-living working in the co-living industry is now it's kind of the right time to do it because this industry is developing and it's really um, interesting so some um, keywords that are really popular right now are, for example, sustainable living, so co-living, um, to make living more sustainable, more eco-friendly, uh, affordable living, co-living to lower costs, and community living. A lot of people are getting more and more lonely. Unfortunately, it's one of the highest uh, reasons for people to, to die on an early age and all the, you know, all the um, effects of loneliness so living in a community um, is getting more and more interesting and popular to people and um, so what is a co-living space there's a lot of um, explanations and uh, about what a co-living space exactly is but one of them is that um, you talking about a co-living space when more than three unrelated people are living under one roof and they're sharing amenities like a kitchen and a bathroom uh, community has to be an important aspect of life in a co-living. So we're not talking about a space where everyone's doing their own thing. Um, community is an uh, important aspect of that life. And someone is responsible for the, responsibility, sorry, responsible for the well-being of this community. 
And that can be the community itself or someone like me who hosts people, um, but someone is responsible. And in my case, because we're talking about a co-living space for digital nomads or remote workers, uh, there has to be a co-working space or at least a space where people can work with reliable internet. Uh, so a few statistics just to give you a little bit of an, of an idea of the, gr the growth that is happening now. You can see this little chart. Um, back in the day, 2013, no one was really looking for the term co-living on Google, but right now it's getting more and more popular. Whereas there's not that many co-livings yet. This number 1100 is all co-livings, so also the sustainable livings, also um, uh, solutions for more affordable living all in one. So it's a pretty small number still, and also this number is a little bit of a guess, but uh, the number of digital nomads in the world is getting bigger and bigger, and we're talking about millions right now, but if we look at the predictions for in about 20 years, people are even talking about billions. Um, so why did I start co-living? Um, for me, it wasn't so much that I saw an opportunity in this market. It was more that after doing remote year, I did Magellan. So this was 2016 on June 2017. Uh, I came back home. I'm from Holland and Holland is an amazing country, but I've never really felt at home myself so much there. So I really wanted to find a place to call home, to feel at home, and not always have the urge to leave and start traveling again. I really like exploring new cultures and kind of starting over. I really like that feeling of starting a whole new life. And uh, I love to be part of the community, and I really learned that during remote year. And apart from that, my personality is to, I really, really like host people. Um, so all of that together really sparked the idea during Remoji mostly and after of, uh, of yeah, starting something up like that. Been a traveler for all of my 20s and I think like all backbreakers, I had the dream of opening a hostel and this became the dream of opening a co-living space. So one of the common questions I get is, so why Tenerife? How did you pick a location? For me, it was, um, I traveled a lot in Central and South America and I speak Spanish. So for me, I always thought I was gonna end up somewhere there, but I'm from Holland, Europe, so the Caribbean or S South America is pretty far away. So I started to think if I wanna do this now on my own, uh, what about Europe where I'm kind of a little bit closer to home. I also have a European uh, passport, so that makes things a bit easier. So what about Spain? Because I speak the language. And I started researching and I came across the Canarian Islands. I'd been there, but only in the south. And the south is very touristy, just hotels. And I never saw myself living there. But then I discovered that the north side of Tenerife has this very different landscape. It's more cultural. There, you know, It's where all the locals live. So I started to, to research a bit more and I found this town called La Oratava in the north of Tenerife and I just uh, really liked the idea of it and started um, emailing people, bloggers, people that lived here uh, to see what they thought about this area. And then I got a real estate agent and I told her I'm coming to Tenerife for 10 days. I came with my parents in January 2018 and I told her I want to see a lot of spaces all around the island, but I want to focus on this town, La Orata, because something in me said that, you know, this might be it. So when I got here, we looked at 11 properties all over Tenerife, uh, but five of them were in La Orata, in this town. And one of them was this building. And this is made on the day that uh, I actually went to look at the house with my parents and the real estate agents. And we just, me, my parents, uh, we just fell in love. Uh, the woodwork, the high ceilings, the views, the roof terrace, there was just not really a way around it that this should be, uh, you know, it was also possible that I could live there. So I all went really fast. I didn't look at any other places, islands, or, you know, countries in the world. And four months later, in June 2018, I moved here and started nine co-living Tenerife. So I've been here a year now and um, started in September 
had a really good high season. High season here is from like November until March in the winter. Uh, had a really good high season and things are still going pretty well. So I'm really happy. So I, yeah, I want to kind of show and share what I think made this place so successful and um, yeah, what can maybe help you to find what a good uh, co-living is. So first of all, for me, uh, it was really important that I stuck with um, what I really wanted to do. So I really followed my heart in this one. So find your why uh, is my first, you know, um, thing to look at. So really know why you want to want to start a co-living, whether it is just as a business opportunity to make money or because you want to change your lifestyle or anything in between. It doesn't really matter as long as I think you stick with it. So for me, it was finding a new home, being part of a community and connect with people. And I really didn't want to work behind the computer that much anymore. And then I developed some core values. So I said, okay, I really want this whole place to be about connection. Um, so connecting with yourself, connecting to others, connecting to nature are three things that you can really do here in this town and on this island, but also in the house. So every business opportunity I take, but also every communication to guests, my social media, the website, I try to really uh, communicate this, um, this value of uh, if you come here, you're going to connect to whether it's yourself, others or nature. Um, but then of course there are some more practical things, right? So first of all, location, location, location. There is so many places in the world uh, where you could choose from that is really hard to kind of make that decision. I think as someone who's traveled the whole world, it's like, how do you make that decision? How is this random town, La Oratava, the right decision? Right. Um, so I think once you find that location, then it's just about working with what you have and don't make it something that it's not. There's a lot of uh, uh, yoga and surf retreats out there that all kind of do the same thing. And it's uh, very tempting to go with that as well and market that. But like what I've learned mostly is that I live in this town, which is very local and Spanish and people really like that. I live in this beautiful old building and there's a volcano. Uh, to really market that instead of, you know, kind of like the mainstream um, vibe of what co-living should be. Um, then the space. Um, what I really did is let, so, which is also a tip for me, is let the space form the experience. So really look at what you have as a space. I was, of course, pretty lucky that I have this kind of like mansion uh, going on here which makes it really easy to let the space kind of form the experience but uh, for example I have this really beautiful rooftop with nice views and we have good weather so every morning there is rooftop yoga every Sunday we have a barbecue on the roof and it's all because I have that rooftop right and then I have this really beautiful uh, workspace with uh, views over the ocean and because that space was there uh, I made the workspace there so I guess it's a little bit about let, letting the space talk to, for itself and see what you can do with it and make that work. And then the community. So the community, if I look at all my reviews and what people say about Nine and about me, then um, people are all talking about the people they've met, uh, the connections they've made, the good time they had, the team they liked. So it's all about the community. And I guess that's the number one reason why people are starting to choose co-livings over just getting an apartment, an Airbnb and working and in a co-working. It's all about that community. So uh, if you're not a community person that much, which you know most of us are on remote here, then find people around you that are, uh, you know, make sure you work your strengths because uh, building that community and have people experiencing that I think is the number one that you accept, of course, reliable internet, but you have to have a good community. So self-driven communities is like a kind of a buzzword that's in this co-living uh, world is coming up more and more often. And I think it's really cool because you have uh, communities that are very surface driven 
or you can now people are starting to try to have communities that are more self-driven right so service driven is of course that five-star hotel all inclusive where you don't have to do anything you come in and everything is taken care of uh, on the other hand you have self-driven so here on the island like i said we have a lot of caves and tents forming a community on the beach where people are just coming in living and staying as long as they want and they're really responsible for their own lives but also the community that is there so they make their own rules they build their own little houses they i don't know they go fishing and share it with each other and if i don't know how they do the garbage for example but it's all self-driven so I started off pretty much all the way on the left, surf, very surface driven. So I was doing everything, <laughs> like everything. I was making breakfast every morning. I was checking people in, checking people out, bringing people to the bus stop, taking them from the airport if it was too late. I was taking them on hikes, going out for dinner. As everything's just me uh, as a service. And, you know, that was not sustainable, although it was a lot of fun, but, you know, uh, not sustainable enough. So I got some volunteers and the volunteers are of course part of the community as well so it got a little bit more self-driven and now i'm at the point that um guests are also having more responsibilities in the house but also in like um um events and dinners and uh we have a family dinner on thursday and first i was always cooking but now i always ask if someone wants to cook right so it's still kind of like orchestrated by me and my volunteers, but uh, it's more guest driven and self driven than it was before. And we all know remote year, I think it's kind of in between as well, where everything is organized for you, but in the month you still have to find your own way and you still have to find a supermarket or a gym. And um, there's, diff there's different events. We have the calendar that's like, um, uh, the official calendar, you know, which is especially for events that are created by remote year, but then we have the unofficial uh, calendar, which is self-driven by the community. So my three biggest tips. If you're interested in starting a co-living, then I would suggest first really find your why and stick with this. Know why you really want to start this co-living, write it down, you know, and stick with this. Uh, intuition over logic. I'm someone who really followed my heart and I really believe that it brought me here. Um, and don't be afraid of FOMO. Uh, what I said before, there are so many spaces in the world that I could have looked at a hundred thousand other buildings or beaches or towns or islands. And I could still be looking because there's always going to be something better or nicer or equally interesting. But at some point you just have to, you know, take a decision and uh, go for it. And that's the third one as well, doing instead of trying. I was always dreaming and looking up internet and looking again and again. And uh, at some point I had to tell myself, okay, just call the real estate agent, just make an appointment, just fly there and see what happens and doing instead of just trying, I guess. Um, so yeah, I learned a, langu a local language. I think this is maybe pretty straightforward, but so important it's uh the, yeah the fact that i spoke pretty well in uh, spanish helped me so much because when you're starting a company you're talking to governments to contractors architects police accountants and uh, name it and it's really nice if you know the local language um but also i live in this uh, really nice local neighborhood and i really like that i can talk to the people and not be that weird gringo all the time who no one really connects to or knows um and you know if you are really living like me in your co-living and people are always coming and going it's really nice to have uh, at some point kind of a social life apart from your co-living and make some local friends so Again, learning the language then really helps. And the last one, uh, find the right people around you. Um, what I found really hard in the beginning is to trust and let go. So uh, the people around me, like my volunteers or the people even in the community that were living at my space, they have suggestions, they have ideas, they want to take this project on and run with it because they feel like they're part of it and uh, trusting that it will go where it's supposed to go instead of like that picture that you have in your head. Um, 
yeah, I think really is a good tip because um, it makes the co-living more alive and more self-driven again and more built by the community itself. Um, so yeah, let people in to build that community. And uh, to do that, again, you have to find your why, stick with it, but then, you know, trust and let go and learn the local language. That was it for me. Um, yeah, if you have any questions, if you want to check out my website or you want to talk about your ideas or anything, let me know. You can email me. Um, we would love to connect. Yeah, and thanks all for listening. I hope, uh, I hope it made sense. <laughs> Uh, that was great. Do you want to jump off a screen share? And I already see some questions coming through. I think people are very curious about your presentation and catching some of your advice on this stuff because obviously you just started it, you've been through it, and yeah, it's super interesting. Um, so Tanner's asking, how are you able to make those connections from scratch? How did you know who to talk to? How did you get an in, etc.? Yeah. Um, so what I what I started with was. Uh, a real estate agent actually that spoke my language which helped a bit so I got a Dutch real estate agent and she connected me to some other people and um, unfortunately she also connected me to the wrong people so I got for example an architect that um, wasn't an architect but I didn't know that so um, he was supposed to help me to getting all my paperwork done and he was just taking months and I didn't hear from him and I knew it was Spain but I was still like it's a little bit too much, mañana, mañana. And um, I found out in the end that he was actually not even qualified to do what I, what I needed him to do. Um, and then after that, I was actually quite lucky, I think, but also I was just uh, on the street and I had a problem in my patio. I had a leak and there was this man on the street working on another house. So I basically just walked over there and asked him if he could have a look at my problem. So again, you know, because I spoke the language that worked out really well. And this man has for the last year been my contractor, my handyman, my everything more or less here. And he connected me to my architect and to the plumber I have now. And uh, it just kind of became his wheel because he has been living here for 30 years or like working here for 30 years, living here for all of his life. So I guess if you find that one person that you can trust, and you build a relationship with, then that could mean a world of difference. Um, that's what worked for me, but yeah, it is kind of hard. I, I was pretty lucky, I think. Yeah, but that one connection led to a bunch more. So yeah, just snowball yeah. effect, it's awesome. Thanks for the question, Tanner. We got a bunch of great questions coming through actually. So James is asking, what's been the best day and what's been the hardest day? And what did you get out of each of those two days? Oh, okay, the hardest day, um, so I had a, I had a, my, my first guests, actually my first official guest. So I started off in September and I had a few remote year people coming cause I posted in Slack that you could come and stay for like my first months with a discount. Right. And then from no end of October on my, I started basically. So the end of October I had this woman uh, coming in and she was going to stay for a month. And she was my first official guest that found me through uh, Google and she ended up staying three and a half months. So that was amazing. It gave me a lot of self-confidence that this was actually working and that she was having a great time. Um, but the day that she left uh, was, I think, one of the hardest days and I kind of broke down because I was like, no, you're supposed to be here and not leave ever. And that was, yeah, that was a really hard day. But also, you know, we're still in contact. So that's, um, yeah. Um, best day. Um, oh, there are so many great days. I, well, actually, I, I did the holidays here. And I, before I, before, when I started, I thought like, okay, I'll see if there's even anyone staying here in December. If not, I make a last minute decision to fly home because I don't want to be alone with Christmas. And it ended up being really uh, full. I had, I think there was 12 of us here staying with Christmas and we had dinner and we had, uh, with New Year's, there was a lot of people. So I guess um, that was really great for me because I was expecting to be maybe all by myself and fly home because I was sad and lonely, but it ended up 
being the other way around. So I think that was one of the happiest moments I had here. Oh, that's awesome. Um, and then Ken, Candy and Tanner are both kind of asking a similar question about like actually financial costs. Feel free to just say you don't want to share or whatever. It's like kind of personal information or kind of sensitive information. But Candy's asking, did yeah. you lose or buy? And then, yeah, like just Tanner's asking what the general startup costs were, if, if you don't mind sharing that. Um, and yeah, was your place moving ready? So I guess kind of all the questions around that, like getting it ready yeah. to have people to actually have guests and like what the kind of costs for some of those things might have been, if, if you're comfortable sharing that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I this building was um, not move in ready, but it's also, it was also uh, it needed some work, but it wasn't too bad. So I had some remodeling done to bathrooms, and the front of the house needed to like be painted again and things like that. But other than that, I painted almost every room in the house, and I used. Um, remote year and friends for that so the first two months when i moved here i posted on slack again like hey i'm moving to tenerife to this building uh, first of june if you want to come help out in the first two months you can stay for free and help me remodel and um tw uh, 26 people actually showed up and 19 of them i didn't know so that was really cool and um so they've helped me and they you know that cost me less because they were staying for free in this house that I had anyway. Um, and then I had a contractor that I, for the bigger jobs. And then the investment. So I have a, a Dutch investor that um, uh, invested in the building for me. So, and I had, when I lived in uh, Utrecht, I had an apartment that I sold with a pretty good uh, revenue or like, um, and that was just luck because I bought it at the bottom of the market. And when I wanted to leave, the market was going crazy. So I was pretty lucky to have a, a good amount of money in my pocket. And then uh, with this investment, I could buy the house. So it's all bought. Uh, I do have a mortgage, but um, I don't have, like no one else has stakes in this company. So I like that. Like the decisions I make are all mine and I don't have to run them by but anyone or I don't have to show up with, with like revenue statistics uh, any, every month or something like that. Um, I know that there's a lot of um, companies out there now that are looking to invest in projects like this because everyone can see that the market's booming. Uh, I mean, Selena, for example, is now, they've raised like millions or billions or I don't know, like a lot of money because people are seeing, uh, seeing, yeah, how, that this is going in the right direction. So I think finding investors is definitely an option. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know. Did I answer all the questions or was there? Yeah, no, I think that was great. That was super So open. yeah, I'm not renting, I'm, I'm buying, yeah. Um, yeah. And then quickly, I guess, we had the question come through, do you have any employees or is it mostly you and volunteers? I have, so I started off right away with one employer for uh, cleaning. So I have a cleaning lady that comes in every morning for about four hours. And sometimes I think that's a little bit too much. So maybe if I could do it over again, she has a fixed contract, but if I could do it over again, I would do a little less, I think, to start with. Um, but um, so yeah, she comes in every morning to just clean the bathrooms, the kitchen, the workspace. And then every week we clean the, she cleans all the rooms that have people in there. Uh, so you get new sheets and towels and stuff. And of course, if people move out and new people have to move in, then she cleans that as well. So yeah, that's my one employer. And then since two months, I have a new employer. And um, because after high season, or actually in the middle of high season, I decided I, that I was it was too much because I was working seven days a week and I had these two volunteers, which I still have, but they were not doing my job. They were like doing the extra things that I needed someone for. So uh, halfway high season, I decided that, okay, I need someone to do what I do a few days, few days a week so that I actually have some days off. So since two months, I now have a, I call her a host. Her name is Katia and she's from Bulgaria and her and her boyfriend moved in. So I actually have them living here, which I really like because they add to that community again. 
um, and um, they um, she works for me two days a week and every other weekend so that's three days a week and then she does uh, the host part so checking people in checking people out just making sure that if people have questions and you know all those things and then she also does my marketing so she does the social media marketing now because there's a lot of a lot of it part of being a host is kind of being around and uh, being there if needed so uh, in that time she can uh, do the social media marketing so I have yeah, two employees right now. And then I always have two volunteers. Uh, they're kind of world packers, right? So that's one of the websites that you have for this. And she, they, I have one that does yoga every morning. So I have a yoga teacher and uh, it's a 25 hour uh, job. So 10 hours for yoga and then I have 15 hours left for other things. So the yoga teacher does the breakfast in the morning and recycling and helps with the barbecue and things like that. And then I have one other volunteer and that's because I have a dog and I adopted her in, in last August and it's a pretty high energy dog. So I have someone that walks her every day and then does other things as well. So that person helps with the groceries and the barbecue and the garden and the patio and they stay for three months at a time. Cool, that's awesome. Um, and kind of speaking of the barbecue and yoga and stuff, Tanner had a question and we'll, we'll finish it on this because I want to be kind of respectful of the time and I think we're already a little bit over, but there's just so many good questions that we could keep going forever, I think. But he was asking, what are your most um, successful and sort of like important community activities or events that happen weekly? Yeah. Um, I started off with trying a bunch and doing too much, I think, because people also just want to do their own thing. Um, uh, so we now have three things that happen like every week. And uh, that's the daily yoga. So we have yoga every morning. Um, and then except for Wednesdays, we do like a more restorative meditation yoga at night. People really like that as well. Then on Thursday, we always host a family dinner, which is very low key. So someone makes uh makes dinner it could be me or it could be someone that wants to cook for everyone um and on sundays we always have the uh the sunday barbecue so we that's a pretty um yeah that's the community the community event of the week basically where everyone's always there and uh yeah and then the barbecue and the yoga is included in the price uh, so you get that because I kind of want everyone to always be there. And then family dinner is five euros. So that's basically covering the costs. Awesome. Um, yeah, and I feel like we should shut it down because we're, we're over time already. But there's obviously so many more questions people have. And like, I have so many questions of my own and I didn't even get to any of them because people were super curious about a bunch <laughs> of things. So thank you guys for your questions. Thanks for joining. And um, Anne, are you cool if people reach out to you? If they have more questions, you're on Slack, you're still like part of the... Yeah, 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 sure. yeah, I would love to chat more about it. So let me know. Yeah. Nice. And thanks again for doing this. This is super interesting. I, I just really love this topic. And I think like all travelers, it's something that swims in our minds of like, maybe someday I should open my own place. So thanks for being like a cool inspiration for people and somebody that actually took that dream and made it real. And go visit Anne, go to Tenerife, go hang out at Grand <laughs> Living. I'm sure she'd love to host you because that's part of her personality, as she said. So thanks mm -hmm. again. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> Ciao.